السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين. الحمد لله حمد كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيك ما يحب ربنا ويرضى. وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. اللهم إنك عفو كريم تحب العفو. Fa'afu anna. Oh Allah, indeed, you are al-afu, the partner. You are the partner, and you love to partner. So partner us. Alhamdulillah, thank you guys for joining us, for coming down to our last couple of classes before the end of Ramadan, alhamdulillah, of our Ramadan series 2024 connecting our hearts with the Qur'an, exploring the verses from the Qur'an that coincided with many of the views and opinions and suggestions of Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu I pray that you guys, you know, got a lot of benefit from these incidents. I pray that you have a greater understanding of the ayats that we've covered. I pray that you have a greater appreciation for individuals like Umar bin al-Khattab whose love and, and honesty, brutal honesty and sincerity helped to mold and shape much of the culture within the Muslim community. Many of the traditions, many of the things that we practice in today's time was as a result of many of the views, opinions and suggestions of Umar bin al-Khattab I pray that this prompts, you know, many of the brothers and sisters to go back and read the stories of these great men and women in our deen who have, you know, given all of themselves so that, you know, we could appreciate the religion of Islam in its full scope. So, alhamdulillah, we're going to continue with the last incident that we covered uh, two days ago, and that was the incident where a group of Jewish men were sitting around reading the Torah. And Umar bin al-Khattab who used to go to them and listen to them uh, quote, the, quote the Torah, quote the, the Torah, and they come to Umar and they said, you know, there's an angel that your prophet mentions that is an enemy to us, and there's an angel that your prophet mentions. It's fine, yeah, it's fine. Just make sure the, the volume is off in terms of, uh, so when the phone rings, it doesn't disturb. Just make sure the, the volume is off. So, uh, Umar radiallahu he said that I used to go to the Jewish people and listen to them recite the Torah. And I used to be amazed at how much the Torah coincides with the Quran. How much the Torah is consistent with the Quran. He said, and on one occasion, one of them came to me and said that there is an angel that your prophet mentions that we hate, that is an enemy to us. And there's, a, there's a, an angel that your prophet mentions that is actually a friend to us. We have a friend from amongst the angels and a foe from amongst the angels. And then Umar he said, well, which angels are you referring to? And they said, the enemy that we have that is, you know, from amongst the angels is none other than, uh, you can put it here. Is none other than Angel Jibreel. We hate him, he is an enemy to us, and we are enemy to him. And they said, the friend of the angels to us is Angel Mikhail. And of course, as they mentioned in another narration in Muqatid ibn Hayyan, he said, قالت اليهود أن جبريل عدونا أمرا أن يجعل النبوة فينا فجعلها في غيرنا فأنزل الله سبحانه وتعالى هذه الآية Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Muqatil ibn Hayyan, one of the scholars of the Tabi'un, he said that the Jews, they said that Angel Jibreel is an enemy to us because he was ordered by Allah to bring revelation down to us, meaning many of the prophets and messengers uh, came from our lineage, came from our lineage. And instead of bringing the revelation down to us, or one of us, he brought the revelation down to one of the Arabs, meaning Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
So it was as a result of that they hate Angel Jibreel. And they said, as for Mikael, he is a friend to us because Mikael is obviously responsible for the provision and uh, they, are, uh, they are happy with their dunya. And so therefore they take no issue with Mikael. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as a result of this, he revealed a verse from the Quran that will be recited until Yom al Qiyamah. And that is the verse found in Surah Al Baqarah, Surah number 2, Ayah 97 and 98. Surah number 2, Ayah 97 and 98, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Man kan, kul man kana aduwa li Jibreel, fa inna hu nazzalahu ala qalbika bi idni Allah, musaddiqan lima bayna yadayhi, wa huda wa bushra lil mu'mineen. That whoever, say, O Muhammad, whoever is an enemy to Jibreel, for indeed Jibreel brings the Qur'an down to your heart by the permission of Allah to confirm the revelations that came before it and as a guidance and glad tidings to the believers. But whoever is an enemy to Jibreel, whoever is an enemy to Allah and Mikail, uh, and, and whoever is an enemy to Allah and to the angels and to his messengers and to Jibreel and to Mikael, Meaning Mikael, for indeed Allah is a adu'un lil kafirin. Allah is an enemy to those who disbelieve. And so Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he came to inform the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa about this conversation that he had with the Jews and only to find that Angel Jibreel had already beat him to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa with these ayats. And when he approached, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said to Umar, Hey Umar, would you like me to recite some ayats to you? that Angel Jibreel just brought to me. And Umar said, of course. And the Prophet Sallallahu began reciting these ayahs to him. And then the Prophet Sallallahu turned to Umar and he said, لَقَدْ وَافَقْتَ رَبَّكْ يَا عُمَارُ He said, Umar, you were consistent with your Lord. Meaning what you said to this group of Jewish men in defense of Angel Jibreel, in defense of Angel Mikael, is in com complete conformity with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to me through Angel Jibreel. He said, Ya Umar, qad wafaqtu rabbak. You have agreed with your Lord once again, Ya Umar. Faqala Umar, laqad ra'aytani ba'da thalika fi deen illahi aslabu min al-hajar. Umar said, after that, I saw myself as it relates to my deen to be so more solid than a rock. I was more solid than a rock when it came to my deen after the Prophet ﷺ revealed this to me. So then we started talking about some of the lessons from this incident. And lesson number one was that true validation should be sought from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We seek, we seek validation from God, not validation from anyone else. As Umar he said that once the Prophet ﷺ revealed to him, that he was, you know, agreed with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what he said, Umar said that after that, I was more solid in my deen than a rock. Meaning because I got the validation. I said something to them, not even knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was going to send Angel Jibreel with ayats that will be recited until Yom Al-Qiyamah that shows that what I said to them was correct. And that we should seek validation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not validation from anyone else. Once you know that you are right with God, then nobody else's validation or criticism should matter. If you don't live in their praise, then you never have to worry about dying in their criticism. If you don't live in their praise, then you should never have to worry about dying in their criticism. But if you're always looking for validation, always hustling for validation from others, then you essentially allow them to control you. Because the person that you rely on for their praise and their validation also controls, they control building you up and they also control breaking you down. You don't ever give someone that much power over you. You don't ever give someone that much power over you. That's called a codependency. You become codependent on other people for their validation, whether that is a spouse, whether that is a child in relation to their parent, Yes, it is always nice for, to hear your spouse say something nice about you. But keep in mind, some spouses are actually in competition with one another. So as a result of that, they can't praise you. As a result of that, they can't say things nice about you. They can't validate you because your success is essentially their failure. That is a fact. There are many spouses that are in competition with one another, unhealthy competition with one another. 
And so you're wondering why you get dressed up or you're wondering why you're making, you know, these successful moves and you're making having these great achievements in your life and your spouse is not really recognizing it. They can't recognize it because your success equals their failure. They can't recognize it. So they're not going to say anything nice about it. They're going to sit and wait for your downfall. Because they can't praise you. They can't validate you. As the scholars say, somebody who doesn't have something can't give you what they don't have. They can't validate you because they haven't validated themselves. When you validate you, you can give validation away generously. You can be generous with your validation because you're not seeking it from anybody. I don't rely on you for how I feel about myself. I rely on me for how I feel about myself. And as a result of that, I can praise people and I can say nice things about people. I can compliment people. I can give that, way, that away freely. Belash. I can give it away for free. But a person who doesn't have that, they can't give it to you. Because they're too busy trying to get it for themselves. They can't validate you because they're empty. They need the validation for themselves. They can't praise you because they need the praise. Number two from the lessons in this incident is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala began the verse with having enmity towards him, even though their enmity and hatred was towards Angel Jibreel. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Man kana adu wa lillahi wa malaikatihi wa rusulihi wa jibreel wa mikal fa inna Allah adu wa lil kafirin. To say, whoever is an enemy to Allah and his angels and his messengers and Jibreel and Mikal then indeed Allah is an enemy to those who disbelieve. But why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala insert himself in that? They didn't say that they were an enemy to God. They said that they were an enemy to Jibreel. But Allah says whoever is an enemy to Allah. Because having enmity and hatred towards one of his messengers, whether from amongst the angels or from amongst mankind, is akin to having enmity and hatred towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To hate anything from the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is essentially to hate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who legislated it. You can't take issue with anything from the deen except that that will ultimately lead you to taking issue with the one who legislated that as a part of the deen. And that is none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't say that you have a problem with polygyny or you have a problem with, you know, this or you have a problem with that. You have a problem with the Prophet Sallallahu You can't, you know, understand how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi can marry Aisha at the age that she was. I have an issue. I take issue with that. Everything else in the religion I'm cool with, but this one issue. Don't you know that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala sent the Prophet Sallallahu in his dream, a picture of Aisha in his dream? And that the Prophet ﷺ marrying Aisha was by divine revelation. The encouragement was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no different than it was when the Prophet ﷺ married Zainab. That came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many of his marriages were legislated from above the seven heavens, encouraged through the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for you to say you take issue with something or take issue with this or that, then you essentially you take issue with God. Your, your issue is not with this matter or that matter or this random issue from the deen. Your issue is an issue of God. And for a Muslim to hate anything from the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove you from the fold of Islam. The only thing that I can encourage you to do is to gain more knowledge because we are afraid and we are fearful of the things that we are ignorant of. That's a fact. The more ignorant you are of something, the more afraid of it you are. The more knowledge you gain of something, the more confident you are in approaching it and discussing it. Number three from the lessons in this uh, incident is confirming the quality of, of, of adawa, of enmity. Adawa which means enmity or hatred. And that is a quality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A quality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he describes himself with in the Qur'an and as he's described with in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an enemy to those who show enmity to his servants. 
that whole whoever shows enmity or hatred to one of the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that is a sure way to earn the enmity and hatred of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned in the hadith of Qudsi, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, مَنْ عَادَ لِوَلِيًّا فَقَدْ آذَنْتُهُ بِالْحَرْبِ that whoever shows enmity or hatred to a, a close friend of mine, then let them take notice of war from me. You want to go to war with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Then show enmity and hatred towards someone that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. You want to go to war with God? Then show enmity and hatred towards someone that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves or someone that is within the realm of the intimacy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is a sure way to earn the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes Bani Israel or the Jews in the in, in Surah Al-Fatiha, a surah that we read every single salah, a surah that your salah is not accepted except if you recite it, and that is غَيْرُ الْمَخْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَوْضَالِينَ those who are those, not those who have earned your anger and your displeasure, and those who are astray. Those who have earned the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the Jews. And those who have earned uh, the misguidance by their own actions are the Nasara, the Christians. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide them to true guidance. The opposite of adawa, the opposite of enmity and hatred is wilaya, is friendship. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a friend to those who believe. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, that Allah is a wali, Allah's wilaya, his guardianship. Allah is a guardian, a friend to those who believe. He brings them from the depths of darkness into the light. Number four from the lessons in this incident is the ongoing enmity and hatred of the Jews towards Islam and the Muslims for various reasons. Here in this incident, specifically, it is as a result of Angel Jibreel bringing revelation down to the Prophet Sallallahu instead of to one of their own. And selecting a messenger, the last and final messenger, to be from amongst the Arabs instead of being from amongst the Jews. As they said, they, the Jews, they said to the Prophet ﷺ, Jibreel, he is an enemy to us. If Mikael had brought you the Quran, then we would believe in you. If Mikael had brought you the Quran, we would believe in you. But because Angel Jibreel brought you the Quran, then, you know, we, we got to reject you. Jibreel comes down with al-qital, wal-shibda, wal-adab. Jibreel only brings punishment, harshness, death. That is what Jibreel represents. As here again, Bani Israel always playing the victim, right? No different than Israel saying, uh, we have a right to defend ourselves. Meanwhile, you slaughter more than 30,000 Palestinian majority women and children. But yet you're doing this under the guise of defending yourself. You are, they are always perpetual victimhood. Perpetual victimhood. They're always the victim. Even if you read in the story of Prophet Musa, they are always the victim. They hide behind their victimhood. They throw a rock and then they hide their hand. You go slaughter 30,000 people between October, and I'm, I'm not even talking about the, 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 the amount of Palestinians that have been slaughtered since 1948 up until now, because this incident didn't happen in October. Didn't happen October 7th. This has been going on since 1948. Meanwhile, you got tanks, you got drones, you got missiles, they're throwing rocks, but you're the victim. You're the victim. You have a right to defend yourself. MashaAllah to them. 
No different than white people in today's society where the young black boy who got into a car accident and he went to you know the nearest house that he can find, knocked on the door because he needed some help, he needed medical attention, and the white guy comes to the door and shoots him. Yeah. Because he was afraid for his life. Here's a guy who just clearly got into a car accident, blood running down his face, knocking on the door because he needs medical attention, and you take the opportunity to shoot him with a shotgun. Under the guise of, I'm, I, 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 I was in fear of my life. This is the same thing that white people say. You go and you wreak havoc on the black community under the guise of, I was in fear of my life. Not realizing that black people are probably more afraid of white people than white people are afraid of black people. I guarantee you, I am more afraid of white people than I would ever be of black African Americans. <laughs> But it's the same argument. And it's the argument of people who have a privilege. Because their fear and our fear is totally different. Their fear and our fear is totally different. And so their refusal to accept the Prophet Wasallam was simply on the basis that he was an Arab. And it's out of pure jealousy, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah number 4, Ayah 54 and 55. nas ala ma Allahu min fadli. Are you jealous of the people because of the virtue that Allah has given them over you? We have given the family of Ibrahim the book, the wisdom, and we have given him given them the family and the lineage and the progeny of Ibrahim, we've given them mulk and azimah. We've given them a great kingdom. And some from amongst them believed and others from amongst them turned away and turned others away and sufficient is the hellfire as a place of refuge for them. And it doesn't matter whether it was this reason or that reason, they are simply a rebellious nation of people. They are a rebellious nation of people who never valued divine guidance to begin with from the time of Prophet Musa السلام, all the way up into our time today. They've changed the book with their hands. They've changed the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How in the world do you go into a divine book? Divine book given to your prophet. Divine book, perfect as it is, and change the words on your own. Change the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There can be no greater form of rebellion than that. Change the books with, from, you know, from their proper places. Right? SubhanAllah, you go into a divine book revealed by God and you change the words. Yeah, I know God said that, but you know, I, I don't, we, don't, we don't ascribe to that. And you change it on your own. And then to make matters worse, you change the words from their proper places and then you present it to the people as if it's the word of God. <laughs> Woe be to those who change the book with their own hands and then present it to the people and say, these are the words of God. And the Christians are guilty of that as well. Changed the Bible so many times. And the fact that there's contradictions in it, which we'll get to that, is an indication that it doesn't come from God. In the Bible, it says God is not the father of confusions, but, but is not the father of confusion, but Christians can't be anything more than confused. Make it make sense. They're confused. Ask them some of the basic questions that many of us have asked your local pastor, your local preacher, your local Sunday school teacher. And they can't give you an answer. Their response to it is just believe in it. No. There are some matters that, yes, we just believe in, but there are some matters like the basis of who God is, that is not something that we just believe in. And this is why Ayat al Qursi is the greatest Ayat in the Quran. Why is Ayat al Qursi the greatest Ayat in the Quran? Someone explain. The greatest ayah in the Quran is Ayat al Kursi. Allah la ilaha illa huwa al hayyul qayyum. La ta'khudu 
سنة ولا نوم له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض من ذا الذي يشفع عنده إلا بإذن يعلم ما بين أيديهم وما خلفهم ولا يحيطون بشيء من علمه إلا بما شاء وسع كرسيه السماوات والأرض ولا يؤده حفظهما وهو العلي greatest ayah in the Quran and the reason why very good Abdul Jabbar the reason why Ayatul Kursi is the greatest ayah in the Quran is because it is the only ayah in the Quran that explains Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the detail that it explains it no room for confusion about our belief in God you will never hear a Muslim imam say just believe in it you will never hear a Muslim scholar say, just believe in it. Just have faith, brother. You just got to have faith. That doesn't exist in our deen. That doesn't exist in our deen. I to Kursi, you want to know about God? Everything that you need to know about God is in I to Kursi. I spent half of a semester Explaining Ayatul Kursi to my sixth grade students. Sixth grade. Took us almost half of the semester to just cover one ayah, part of the curriculum. There is no just believe with your heart, brother, just, you know, have faith. No, especially not when it comes to the asl, the foundation of our belief in God. And so they gave Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Bani Israel, they gave Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala an oath to follow the last and final prophet. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed who that last and final prophet was, they rejected it. They knew. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ They knew Prophet Muhammad was a prophet just like they knew their own children. They knew he was the prophet. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took an oath from them. That they would follow him when he emerged. Allah says in Surah number 5, Ayah 70. Turn to Surah, uh, surah Al-Na'idah, Ayah number 70. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ أَخَذْنَا مِثَاقَ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ وَأَرْسَلْنَا إِلَيْهِمْ رُسُلًا We have taken a mithaq, we have taken an oath, a serious oath from Bani Israel. And we have sent to them messengers, and every messenger that came were always left some type of remnant of information about the last prophet. We took an oath from them, and we sent messengers to confirm that this last and final prophet was coming. But then Allah says, كُلَّمَا جَاءَهُمْ رَسُولٌ Every time a messenger came to them, بِمَا لَا تَعْوَى أَنفُسُمْ with something that they themselves didn't desire. A group from a prophet, a group from a And so they made the promise, but then they turned their backs out of arrogance. And this is why Umar asked them in the hadith, Do you all know and recognize that you do realize he is the true prophet, right? We know that he's the messenger of Allah. And Umar, you mean to tell me this whole time you guys knew that he was the messenger of Allah, and yet you still refuse to follow him? He said, Antum Ahlakum, you are the most, you are the worst of the people to know that he is the true prophet and refuse to follow him. Which brings us to lesson number five, and that is to know the truth and not follow it makes you worse than those who simply don't know the truth. 
to know the truth and not follow it, it makes you worse than the people who don't know the truth at all. And this speaks volumes to us as Muslims, that many of us know the truth, we know la ilaha illallah is the truth, we know Islam is the truth, yet we refuse to follow it. Except if it's on our terms. Many of us as Muslims, we want to follow Islam when it's on our terms. I'm going to fast a couple of days in the month of Ramadan, but you know, I'm tired, I don't feel like fasting no more. You stop. Yeah, I know we got to pray five times a day. I prayed the morning prayer, you know, just because I was up. I just happened to be up, so I prayed. But the other five, you know, the other four, uh, you know, busy, man. You know, I, I got you know, a lot going on in my day. I'm working, you know, taking, trying to take care of my family. Got a million and one excuses because we want to practice Islam on our terms. That's not the way that Islam is practiced. And someone should explain that to you from the very beginning before you took your shahada. And if someone did explain that to you before you took your shahada and you still chose to practice Islam on your terms, then you are worse than a disbeliever who doesn't even know the truth. And this is why the hypocrites are in the lowest depth of the hellfire, even lower than the disbelievers. Think about the disbelievers during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu They lived in Medina. They were around the Prophet Sallallahu Saw him, talked to him, engaged with him, and yet still refused to see the truth of Islam. And that's why Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ فِي الدَّرَكِ الْأَسْفَلِ مِنَ النَّارِ The hypocrites are in the lowest depth of the hellfire. Why? Because they knew the truth and they refused to follow it. That's different than the mushrik, an idolater or disbeliever who doesn't know the truth, never had the opportunity or never sat down to take time out to read or learn about Islam. That's different. But the hypocrite who knows and refuses to follow, that makes them worse than those who actually don't even know. And this is why the Jews, between the Jews and the hypocrites, of the Jews and the Christians, they are the worst of the two because the Jews, they know. They knew Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was the Prophet. It was described, he was described in their book. Which is why many of the Christians of today, if you go back to the, the Bible, the description of the Prophet وسلم, was in every religious book. The Jews, obviously, they changed it. So by the time it got into the hands of the Christians in the New Testament, they can't decipher it. They can't decipher it. But the closest that a Christian would come to the description of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi in, in the Bible is in chapter John, the verse about the Comforter, where he said that if I don't go, then the Comforter can't come. But if I go, the Comforter will come. Listen to the description. The Comforter. What did, how did Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala describe the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Rahmatan lil alameen. A mercy for all of mankind. That's how he's described in the Quran. One of the many descriptions Allah gives him in the Quran. A mercy for all of mankind. In the Bible, there's a verse where it talks about, Jesus talks about the comforter. He said, I, it's for me now that I must go. And if I don't go, then the comforter will not come. But if I go, the comforter will come and he will inform you of everything that is to take place in the future. Didn't the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam give us a detailed description of the last day, signs of the last day, things that would take place in the last day, as well as things that would happen in Yomul Qiyamah. Everything that is to come. Absolutely. But if you were to ask the Christians, who was Jesus referring to? You get a million and one responses. He was referring to the Holy Spirit, was referring to John, was referring to this one, was referring to that one. Meanwhile, every person that they bring to fit that description does not fit that description like Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam fits that description. Here again, the arrogance. Arrogance. But to know the truth and not follow it makes you worse than those who choose not, who choose to, you know, remain ignorant of it. And this is why the hypocrites are in the lowest depth of the fire in relation to the disbelievers. And this is why the Jews are the worst of the two between them and the Christians. Number six from the lessons in this, inc this incident is that one of the greatest reasons for not following the truth while you know better is as a result of arrogance, kippur. 
One of the greatest reasons why people who know the truth and still refuse to follow it is arrogance. And keep it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran about the Jews, is it the case that every time a prophet comes to you with something that you don't desire, you become arrogant? And a group from amongst them you kill, and a group from amongst them you belong. You reject. Arrogance is one of the greatest causes of rejecting the truth when it comes to you. When someone comes to you as a Muslim and says, Hey, Akhi, this is haram, you shouldn't be doing that. Man, ain't nobody trying to hear all of that. Arrogance. Oh boy, here come the haram police. Arrogance. Rejecting the truth. One of the main reasons that people reject the truth, even about themselves, is arrogance. The Prophet ﷺ said, Al kibru batru al haq wa qamtu al nas. Arrogance is rejecting the truth when it comes to you and looking down on others. That's arrogance. Not that you take pride in how you look, not in the fact that you, you carry yourself in a dignified manner. That's not arrogance. Not the fact that you don't roll out a red carpet to allow people to walk over top of you. Not the fact that you are not afraid to tell people no. All of those things that we attribute and associate with arrogance is not arrogance at all. You ask me, hey, can you do this? And I tell you, no, I'm not gonna do that. Oh, you're arrogant. Okay. That's what you say. But me telling you no doesn't mean that I'm arrogant. That's me setting a boundary. Because if I don't set a boundary, you'll run amok. You'll take complete advantage of me. Understand the power that is in no. Right, and that is between me and Allah. Not if you're doing it in public. If you're doing it in public, it's for public consumption. It's not between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you commit a sin in your home and no one knows about it, that's between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the moment that you do it in public and you broadcast your sins in front of everybody, then it's for public consumption. It's not between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's no longer between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How is it between you and Allah and you did it in public? You posted it on social media. You made a display of your sins in front of everybody and then say, that's between my sins are between me and Allah. Yes, the sins that you commit that are between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once you do them in public, then you subject yourself to public scrutiny. So one of the greatest reasons for not following the truth when you know better is as a result of arrogance. Arrogance. We don't want to be held accountable. We don't want to be told that we're wrong. And that trickles over into our marriages and our relationships with our children, our relationships with our parents. People just simply don't want to be held accountable. They don't want to be told that they're wrong. It's arrogance. And let me make it easy for you. If you're a person that cannot accept that you are wrong, if you're a person that deflects and runs and rejects every time someone brings to your attention that you are doing something wrong or that you made an error, let me make it easy for you. Let me give you an easy way to learn how to accept correction. Ready? An easy way for you to accept correction is that the next time someone brings to your attention that you did something wrong, just simply say to yourself, this is a reminder to me that I am still human. That's it. When someone brings your mistake to your attention, that is a reminder to you that you are still human. No matter how no matter how superhuman we believe we are or beyond human we believe we are, you're still human at the end of the day. You make mistakes, other people make mistakes. Today is your mistake, tomorrow is somebody else's mistake. Today is your mistake, tomorrow is somebody else's mistake. But the fact of the matter is that we all make mistakes. The Prophet said, That the all of the children of Adam make mistakes, commit sin. And the best of those who commit sin and make mistakes are those who repent. And part of repentance is acknowledging you're wrong. So just be the best sinner that you can be. Be the best 
person that makes an error or a mistake that you can be. And that is by acknowledging the mistake and asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. It's that simple. But the reason why we're ducking and dodging, you know, when people, you know, are bringing to our, you know, attention the mistakes that we make is because it conflicts with who we believe we are. It conflicts with who we believe we are. It's dangerous for a person to begin to accept who he is based upon what he believes about himself. Your thoughts about yourself can be some of the most toxic thoughts that you can harbor. What you believe about yourself. It can be some of the most toxic thoughts that you entertain in your life. And those are the thoughts that you have about the beliefs that you have about yourself. Because that's the way you see you. Other people don't see you like that. And so when someone brings to your attention, you make this mistake or that mistake, we rush to put up this wall because the information that they're trying to bring to us conflicts with what we believe about ourselves. Going a little deep into the psychology realm, but that's, that's one of the reasons. There's this conflict between what the person is bringing you and what you believe about yourself. So the, it's not the person that's bringing to your attention that's at fault. It's your thinking about yourself that is at fault. Because you start to drink your own Kool-Aid. You start to drink your own Kool-Aid. Number seven from the lessons in this incident is that the religious texts, the Torah, the Injil, and the Quran all complement one another and do not contradict one another. Religious texts all complement one another and that is complement with an E, not an I. Complement with an I means to pay someone a compliment. You look nice. Compliment with an I. Compliment with an E means to be in conformity with. And some people, they confuse those two words. All religious texts complement one another. They don't contradict one another. Umar said that he went over to the Jews because he was amazed at how their book, the Torah, aligned and complemented the Quran. And this coincides with the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah number 12 in Surah Yusuf, Ayah 111. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you have your English translation of the Quran, turn to Surah to, uh, to Yusuf, Surah number 12, Ayah 111. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةٌ لِّهُلِ الْأَلْبَانِ That indeed you have in the stories of the prophets and messengers mentioned in the Qur'an عِبْرَةٌ Lessons for men of, of, of wisdom and understanding. مَا كَانَ حَدِيثَ يُفْتَرَى These are not made up stories or fables. وَلَكِنْ تَصْدِيقَ الَّذِي بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ But it is a confirmation of the books that came before it. وَتَفْصِيلًا لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ And a detailed explanation of everything. وَهُدًا وَرَحْمًا And guidance and mercy لِقَوْمٍ يُؤْمِنُونَ For people who believe. That's the description that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave of the Quran. But one of the descriptions he mentions here is that it complements the books that came before it. The Quran does not conflict with the books that came before it. So whenever you read the Old Testament, the New Testament, and you see a complete contradiction from what we see in the Quran, we know the Old Testament and New Testament have been tampered with. It has been changed. And we know for a fact that the Quran has never been tampered with, never been changed. So which one do we use as the blueprint? Which one do we use as the gauge? The Quran. So if you find something in the Old Testament, New Testament that conflicts with the Quran, then that in fact is the words of man, not the words of God. And if we find something in the, those two books that confirms what is in the Quran, then in fact it is the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the words of Allah never contradict one another. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turned to surah number 3, ayat 3. 
Surah Al Imran, Surah number three, Ayah three. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala He says, "نزل عليك الكتاب بالحق مصدقا لما بين يديه وأنزل التوراة والإنجيل." Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says that He sent down the book in truth to confirm the revelations that came before it, and He revealed the Torah and the Injil. Meaning, he revealed what came before it from the books of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would never contradict one another. The books of Allah, the books of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are consistent. Move on to lesson number eight. This is kind of like a very detailed here. So lesson number seven was that the previous books they all complement one another. The religious texts, they all complement one another. And that's how we know that it is the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The words of Allah, number, number eight, lesson number eight is that the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would never contradict one another. The books are consistent. And now we move on to lesson number eight. And that is that the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would never contradict one another. Turn to surah number four, ayah 82. 482 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Afala yatadabbaroon al-Qur'an Afala yatadabbaroon al-Qur'an Afala yatadabbaroon al-Qur'an Law kana min indi ghayni allahi la wajadu fihi ikhtilafan kathiran in Surah number 4, Ayah 82, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks a rhetorical question. Don't they ponder and reflect on the Qur'an? Of course they do. Of course they do. Don't they ponder and reflect on the Qur'an? The disbelievers are all through the Qur'an looking for contradictions. That's all they do. They get the Qur'an, they look and read and read and looking for contradictions. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala welcomes this search for contradictions. Don't they ponder and reflect on the Quran? If this Quran was from anyone other than God, they would have found much contradictions in it. That means that the contradictions that you find in the Bible, the Old Testament, New Testament, the contradictions that you find in there are from man, not from God. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that it had it been from anyone other than Allah, you would have found in it much contradictions. Which means that if we don't find any contradictions in the Quran, then that means it cannot be from anyone other than God. And if we look at the other books, the other revelations, and we see contradictions in it, and we see much contradictions, well, Allah, Allah, I'll never forget the conversation I had with my grandmother before she passed. SubhanAllah. And this was like, I was a new Shahada, so I was, reading and I was learning and absorbing information at a very fast pace you know and I was always debating with my family members going back and forth with my family members I learned something sitting lectures take notes and then off I would go to my family members giving them down and I go to my grandmother who was a devout Christian man devout Christian I have never seen a woman in my life that was more devout devotely dedicated to her church and to Christianity like my grandmother. I'm not talking about someone, I'm talking about someone who lived in the church, literally. And I said to my grandmother one day, I said, Grandma, you do know that there are contradictions in the Bible, right? I was reading, at the time I was reading that book, the uh, Muslim Christian Dialogue. Ever seen that little booklet, that little pamphlet? And it brings, it, it highlights all of the contradictions that are in the Bible. Verse by verse by verse by verse. It's called the Christian Muslim Dialogue. Very, it was a very popular book when, back when I first took my Shahada, right? And then all everybody, every new Shahada was reading that because we were using that for ammunition, right? We go back to our non-Muslim family members and we want to debate with them. We want to make sure that we got our arguments correct, right? And I said to my grandmother, I said, Grandma, you know that there are contradictions in the Bible. And my grandmother looked at me in my face and she said, I know there are contradictions in the Bible. I said, well, Grandma, how can you follow something 
that has contradictions in it. How can you dedicate so much of your life and your soul to something that you know is riddled with contradictions? And my grandmother looked at me and said, can I just die the way that I am? And I said, SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. She said, can I just die the way that I am? And it goes back to this statement that um, Einstein said. He said, most people would rather die than think. And most people do. SubhanAllah. Most people would rather die than think. And most people do. I couldn't, like, this woman that I have loved my entire life, man. I never saw her the same after that. I mean, the love for her is still there, but this great woman that I saw, you know, as a kid growing up, seeing my grandmother kind of keep, you know, the family together on my father, this is on my father's side. I, I you know, I saw her as a superwoman, could do no wrong. And after that conversation, wallahi, as the Arabs say, sakata min aini. She fell from my eyes, man. I didn't see her as a superwoman anymore because I saw her entire life as a contradiction, as a walking contradiction. Every time you grab your Bible and put it underneath your arm and walk out your door and go into the church, you are going knowing that something ain't right about this. But I'm going to keep the faith you can't be a superhero in my eyes and your life is a walking contradiction man. you can't I'm sorry truth if truth becomes your kryptonite you can't be a superhero you can put that on a t-shirt if truth is your kryptonite you can't be a superhero because in order for you to embrace you being a superhero, you got to be able to accept truth no matter how hard it is, no matter how difficult it is. And you got to be able to submit to that truth, whether it's for you or against you. That is what makes you a superhero in my eyes. So the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are not inconsistent. They would never contradict one another. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah number 44, ayah 82, أَفَلَايَ تَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ Don't they ponder and reflect on the Qur'an? لَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجِدُمْ فِيهِ إِخْتِلَافٍ كَثِيرًا If this Qur'an had been from anyone other than Allah, you would have found in it much contradictions. So the fact that you can't find any contradictions in the Qur'an is an indication, strong indication that it is from none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On the authority of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, and the Nafran kana julusan bibab in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Faqala ba'aduhum alam yakuli allahu kada wa kada wa kada. Waqala ba'aduhum alam yakuli allahu kada wa kada. Fasami'a dharika an Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fakharaja. فكأنما فقئ في وجهه حب الرمان فقال أبي هذا أمرتم أو أبي هذا بعثتم أن تضربوا كتاب الله بعضه بعضا عبد الله بن عمر بن العاص This is for the Muslim community pay attention so that we don't fall into what the Jews and Christians have done with their revelation Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has entrusted the Quran to us. He's vowed to protect it, but he's also entrusted us with it. Abdullah bin Amr bin al-As, he said that there was a group from amongst the Sahaba out in front of the house of the Prophet wasallam, and they were arguing with each other about ayats from the Quran. So some of them said to another, some of one group said to another, doesn't Allah say in the Quran such and such and such and such? And then the other group would say, well, doesn't Allah say in the Qur'an such and such and such and such? They're going back and forth with one another about ayahs from the Qur'an. And the Prophet Sallallahu he heard them debating in front of his house. And the Prophet Sallallahu came out 
And his face was red. His face, as we used to say in the hood, beat red. The Prophet's face was pomegranate red. That's what the narration mentioned. They likened the redness of his face to a pomegranate. Meaning he was extremely angry at what the Sahaba were doing. So he comes out and his face is red and he says to the Sahaba, is this what you all have been commanded to do with the have been commanded to do with the Quran? He said, Is this is is this why you were sent? This why I was sent to you? For you to take the Quran and use it to contradict one part, to contradict the other? To take the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and debate with one another. Well, Allah says here, but he also says here, and you're going back and forth with one another with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, إِنَّمَا ضَلَّتْ الْأُمَمْ قَبْلَكُمْ He said, indeed, the nations that came before you went astray. فِي مِثْلِ هَذَا By doing this exact same thing. Taking the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, taking the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu and making it contradict one another. Meaning taking verses that you believe conform with your desires and this person take a verse that they believe conforms with their desires and then we're debating with one another about it. Guys in prison do the same thing all the time because of their lack of knowledge, the lack of access to real knowledge. Their lack of access to real knowledge. And so you'll find them always in these debates with one another about, and, and I mean, the, the fact of the matter is not even an issue of debate. Not when it comes to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're not talking about thick issues that scholars debate about. And, and we're talking about verses from the Quran. Taking verses from the Quran, applying it to your desires or interpret it from your desires any way that you see fit. And you're making the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala contradict parts of it, contradict other parts. The Prophet ﷺ said that indeed the nations that came before you went astray for this very thing. He said, Basically telling the Sahaba, don't do this. He said, whatever you have been commanded to do in the Quran, then do it. And whatever you have been ordered to stay away from in the Quran, stay away from it. That's it. The Quran is broad instructions. The Quran doesn't give you details. The details are in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. But whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands you to do, then do it. And whatever He forbids you, then stay away from it. The Quran is simple in that, in that particular regard. And this narration was collected in the Muslim of Imam Ahmed and the Sunan of Ibn Majah. Number nine from the lessons in this incident is the loyalty that we should have for Islam. The loyalty that we have for Islam and for everything that is connected to our religion. And Umar made it clear that if you are enemy to Jibreel, and you are enemy to Mikail, then you are enemy to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are enemy to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't care what part you say you like, what part you say you don't like. You are enemy to one thing as it relates to Islam, you are enemy to everything. You hate one thing in Islam, you hate everything. Our deen is an all or nothing deen. You don't get to pick and choose from the religion what you want and what you don't want. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminded Bani Israel when he said, Do you believe in part of the book and you reject part of the book? That's not our deen. Our deen is an all or nothing deen. You don't get to pick and choose, cherry pick what you want and then leave off what you don't want. That's not the religion of Islam. You might want to go back to Christianity or go find some other faith that allows you to do that. But in Islam, we are all or nothing deen. You love all of the deen or you hate a part of it and essentially you hate all of the deen. You don't get to dislike a part of the deen and, you know, and like other parts. That's not, that's not how it works. The believers are friends and protectors and maintainers of one another. They love each other. We don't necessarily have to like each other, but we love each other for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning, personally, me and you, 
we may have had some issues in the past. Maybe your son married my daughter, maybe I married your mom, or whatever the case may be. We had some interaction, and as a result of that, the situation went sour, we don't like each other, whatever the case may be. Happens. However, I will never not love you for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, regardless of how I feel about you personally. I will never not love you for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does it mean to love you for the sake of Allah? We just covered the idea of the night. What did the Prophet sallallahu said that let he who believes in Allah in the last day, what? Love for his brother, what he loves for himself. And hate for his brother, what he hates for himself. Hate for your brother what you hate for yourself, love for your brother what you love for yourself. That is the bare minimum of what is due to every Muslim, regardless of how you feel about the person. I would never want to see you make a mistake. I would never want to see you do something haram and end up in the hellfire. I would never rejoice at your downfall or at your slip or at your error or at your mistake. I would never rejoice at that. Number one, there are divine consequences for doing that. Because the very thing that you laugh at is usually the very thing that you fall into later on. By default. That's just the way that it goes. The Prophet said, La tuhiru shamatata li akhi. Do not express joy and happiness at the downfall of your brother or your sister in Islam. For at least Allah will have mercy on them and forgive them for their mistake and test you with the same thing that they were tested with. You don't want that. You don't want that. When you see your brother or your sister being tested with something in Islam, there's a dua the Prophet Sallallahu taught us to make when we see that. Alhamdulillah alladhi aafani mimma batalahu bihi wa faddalani ala kathira mimman khalaqa tafdila. All praises due to Allah who has spared me for what he has tested him with and has favored me over much of his creation. Because why did Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala test them and not you? That's a favor. Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala extended that to you. You understand? Do not ever show happiness or rejoice at the downfall of a slip or the mistake of your brother or your sister in Islam. Because the divine consequences of that is that you will fall ultimately into the very same thing. Wallahi, I've seen it with my own eyes. I've seen it with my own eyes. It happened so many times throughout my few years as a Muslim. Don't ever show happiness or rejoice at the downfall of your brother or your sister in Islam. For indeed Allah will have mercy on them and forgive them for what they fell into and test you with the same exact thing. And also by doing this, this is a telltale indication that you don't love your brother what you love for yourself. You don't love for your brother or your sister in Islam what you love for yourself. Because if you rejoice at somebody's downfall... Right? You see a Muslim make a mistake and you say, ha look, look what happened to him now. And you rejoice at their downfall, then that means that you don't love for your brother or your sister what you love for yourself. You don't hate for them what you hate for yourself. Because if you would dislike that for yourself, then you should dislike the same for your brother and your sister in Islam. But the believers are friends and protectors of one another, and therefore their loyalty is to one another and their deen. You never, a Muslim should never sell another, another Muslim under the, up, up the river. Another Muslim should never throw another Muslim underneath the bus. We do our best to protect one another. We are protectors of one another. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, uh, I forgot to write the number of the ayah down, but you guys can Google it and find the ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا تجد قوم يؤمنون بالله واليوم الآخر يؤدون من حد الله ورسوله you will not find a people who believe in Allah in the last day showing friendship and loyalty and allegiance to those who are enemies to Allah and His Messenger. Even if it is their fathers, or their children, or their brothers, or their family members. That these people Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written for them and decreed for them true faith in their hearts and have strengthened them with the spirit from himself. 
These are the group, the party of Allah, and indeed the party of Allah will always be successful to the end of the ayah. The loyalty that we have. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, they came, the Jews, they came to Umar and said, there's an angel that your prophet mentions that we hate, that we have an issue with, that is an enemy to us. And there's an angel that your prophet mentions that is a friend to us. Umar said, who are you referring to? Who's the, who's the enemy and who's the friend? They said, oh, the enemy that we don't like is angel Jibreel. And the friend that we like is Mikael. Umar said, you can't be a friend to Mikael and an enemy to Jibreel. If you're an enemy to Jibreel, then you're an enemy to Mikael. And if you're a friend to Mikael, then you're a friend to Jibreel. That's our deed. All or nothing. You don't get to say, oh, I like these Muslims over here, but I don't like these Muslims over here. You don't like these Muslims over here, then you don't like none of us. Our loyalty is to one another. We move as a unit. You don't work amongst your co-workers and then your, one of your co-workers catch you on the side and say, yeah, I like you, you're a good Muslim, but that Muhammad over here, I don't like that Muhammad. Say, yeah, well, you know, because you want to you throw your brother under the bus. Well, you know, all Muslims ain't Muslim, you know. SubhanAllah, I mean, you throw your brother under the bus like that. Even if he is, you know, not the best of Muslims. Remember your loyalty to Islam, man. That means everything in the face of people who are not Muslim. They need to understand that we are a unified rank, even though amongst our ranks, we have our own issues, we have our skirmishes, we have our, you know, we're human. We're still dealing with our issues. There's racism amongst the Muslims. There's tribalism amongst the Muslims. There's favoritism amongst the Muslims. There's nepotism amongst the Muslims. There's all types of isms amongst the Muslims because we're human. We're not perfect. But that is what goes on in our ranks. But when we present ourselves in front of the world, we present ourselves as a unified front. You don't get to like me and you don't like Muhammad and I'm a better Muslim. No, he's still, that's my brother. I'm not going to let you dog him out like that. That's still my brother. But we're human. Yeah, well, you know, I like you as a Muslim. I, I don't really like Muhammad. That's okay. But that's my brother. And we're not all perfect. Are you perfect? Are you Christian? Yes. Do you, do you like all Christians? Well, they are my Christian brothers and sisters. Okay, well, that's my brother in Islam. He's not the most perfect Muslim, but neither am I. And you're not the most perfect Christian. You understand? Our loyalty is to one another. And Omar made that very clear. You can't be a friend to Mikael and an enemy to Jibreel. And you can't be an enemy to Jibreel and a friend to Mikael. You're either a friend of all or a friend of none. That's the way that our deen works. You're a friend of all or you're a friend of none. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveal ayahs confirming the very same thing. That's our loyalty. Our loyalty is to our deen. Our loyalty is to one another. Brothers and sisters, take that with you, man. There's so much division amongst our ranks because here we bring that individualistic mentality into our deen. Everything that we do, we do together. We pray together, we fast together, we make hajj together. We do everything together. We give charity and sadaqa to help one another. Everything that we do in our deen, we do our, and we do together. Regardless of how we feel about each other personally. I don't need to like you personally. If you're going to make hajj and I'm going to make hajj, we're going to make hajj together. I don't care how I feel about you personally. We're going to perform this act of ibadah, this act of worship together. I don't care how I feel about you personally. I come in a message to pray. I come in a message to pray. I'm not coming to make friends. I may not like you, but I'm going to stand next to you and pray. That's our loyalty, that's our deen. And we need to learn how to mature, brothers and sisters, from this day forward. Let your personal issues with a brother or sister in Islam remain your personal issues. But never let that stop you from giving your brother or your sister in Islam their rights as a Muslim. And never let that stop you from stopping someone violate those rights. I'm not gonna let anybody violate your rights. I'm not gonna violate your rights. I may not like you, I may not rock with you personally, but I will never deny you your right as a Muslim. 
Because my feelings about you are personal and the rights that I am obligated to give to you came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not from me. So when you walk in the message and you say, Salaamu Alaikum, even though I know you the brother that, you know, you did a bad business deal with me, you sold me a car that was a limit, and I know you did it, and I know you did it because you hustling, you trying to make money, and you, I'm a casualty of your war with yourself, I get it. But you walk in the masjid and I, you know, I got some personal feelings about you and you say, Salaamu Alaikum, why are you going to sit down? I'm going to give you your house. I'm not going to deny you your rights because of how I feel about you personally. And we have to learn how to, you know, become more mature with this. It's affecting our ranks, it's affecting our community in the worst way. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his tawfiq. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us success. For indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is capable of that and he has power over all things. Sallallahu ala nabiya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salam Five minutes. Five minutes? Okay. So we got five minutes inshallah ta'ala before we um, conclude our class. I don't know if there was any questions or comments about what was presented. So um, uh, Eid will either be Tuesday or Wednesday. So that means that Monday may possibly be our last day fasting. So that means that we essentially have about three, four more days. We have tomorrow, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, three, and maybe Tuesday, depending on when the, the, the moon is sighted. So with that being said, Ramadan is coming down to you know a close. Alhamdulillah, I know that our hearts are starting to feel the pressure of the gates of Jahannam, the gates of the hellfire, you know, being open, the gates of Jannah being closed, the shayateen, the shale, uh, the devils being released back into the world. And keep in mind, when the devils are released back into the world, they are released with an intensity unlike they had when they were in chained up. You understand? Because they've been chained up, locked away. They can't do what they have been put there to do. And that is to wreak havoc on the souls of the children of Adam. And so you notice, if you pay attention, every time, right on the, either the day of the Eid or the day after, you know, it's just an intensity of haram that Muslims are engaging in and falling in, you know, and it's very unfortunate because many Muslims are not preparing for the exit. You have to have an exit strategy going out of Ramadan. You can't just let Ramadan come to a stop, an abrupt halt. Monday comes, call us, and then tomorrow, you know, Tuesday come, and you're feeling empty on the inside because there's no more fasting, no more iftar, no more lectures, no more nothing, and you didn't do anything. You didn't create an exit strategy. Right now, you need to be figuring out how am I going to exit Ramadan and still maintain this faith this conviction that I have built up during these days. Inshallah ta'ala, I will try to help with that tomorrow with the khutbah. Give you some tips and tools on how to exit Ramadan and create an exit strategy to help you. Because this is the long game. This is the long game. This is a marathon. It's not a sprint. We're going all the way until the angel of death come to take our souls. There's no hiatus. There's no sabbatical in Islam. We don't take a pause or a break because I need to go and enjoy myself in the dunya and then I'll come back to Islam. No, that's not the way that that works. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَعْبُدَ رَبَّكَ حَتَّى يَتِّيَكَ الْيَقِينَ Worship your Lord until death overtakes you. The end goal for us is death. So how do you maintain all of this that you have built up during these past 29, 30 days? How do you maintain that? It's the difference between a person who someone drops a million dollars in your lap and you don't know what to do with it because you don't have a game plan. You don't have, you know, you don't have anything, you know, a continual plan put in place to help you maintain it. And so within a year's time, you spent the entire million because you didn't have a plan. And someone dropping a million dollars in your lap and you know exactly what you're going to do with it. I'm going to invest this over here, I'm going to invest this over here, I'm going to buy this, and this is going to be an investment, I'm going to buy that, because you want that money to continue generating more money. Money makes money, right or wrong. Any business, business folks here? Money makes money. 
And faith produces more faith. You build faith, you should be looking for ways on how I'm going to maintain this. Allah gave you 29, 30 days to build up your spiritual powers, to build up this spiritual fortitude that you have been building. How are you going to maintain that after Ramadan is over? Are you like the person who we drop a million dollars in your lap and because you don't have a game plan, you spend it all within the first six months? Spending frivolously. Because that's what most people do with their faith. As soon as Ramadan is over, you send it over here, send it over here, send it. And you don't know, every time you sin, you're making a withdrawal from your spiritual account. So there's a million dollars in your account. You go to the ATM, I'm going to take out 20 grand. Take out another 20 grand. Take out 15 grand. Take out five grand. Take out two grand and give over here. Take out 5,000 because I want to buy this. Take out 10,000 for that. 10, 20, 15, 25, 30. Eventually, you're going to go to the ATM, put your card in, and you don't have no money in your account. That's exactly what happens when you continue to sin immediately after Ramadan. And you're sinning and sinning and sinning and sinning and you're just making these withdrawals from your spiritual bank account. Everything that you have deposited in Ramadan is almost used up by July. July come and you are a mess already. And Ramadan doesn't come back in until almost another year. You still got about eight months left before Ramadan comes in again. We can't keep moving like this. You gotta learn how to, you know, to preserve and maintain what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us.